Leadership Bases team presenting on the Reconnaissance Mission Debrief System. Um, I am Joshua Gagne, Gary Chris, Jason Bialy, and Matt Aliota. <laughs> so Matt, why don't you uh, start us off? Yeah, we're going to take this presentation a little bit of a different direction. We're going to cover the requirements up front. Uh, and some of the basic architecture says that's mainly what we're developing for good chip bases. But then we're going to break things down and talk about the feature groups in more detail. We'll give you a demo of each. Closing things out by talking about the methodology we chose and how we overcame some of the challenges we faced in the development of this product. So the DB110 is an infrared and visual reconnaissance body used by Greece, Japan, Pakistan, Poland, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and the UK. They attach to fighter jets like the F-15, the F-16, the MQ-9 Reaper drone, P-3 Orion sub and the Panavia Tornado. So what does this DB-110 do? It collects reconnaissance data. Uh, but when the plane lands after a mission and they don't get the data they need, uh, the only recourse that operators have right now is to send that data back up the stream to UTAS. They want the ability to be able to go through the data collected by this pod, look at the mission, see what went wrong. Was there an error with the pod? Was there an error with how the pilot flew? Mission, was there an error with the software that was collecting the data? So that's what they've asked us to develop a program to do. We built a core application for them with the intention that they would then take this under delivery and develop new pieces of functionality for it uh, post delivery. As, as technical demonstrations to give them a baseline to build off of uh, within our frame. Obviously, modular, modular design is important for this since we're really developing uh, a framework that they're going to extend later on. We divide our functionality into four main packages. The core is designed as the entry point to our application. We really start the two uh, halves of it. On the one hand, we start up the main GUI from this point, and on the other hand, we spawn our application context, which takes the role of an overall controller. On the other side, we have data. This is a layer that encapsulates both the mission data and the information used by the panels themselves. Uh, the accessors over here can easily be extended for each panel to use new kinds of data. Obviously, a panel that's giving you a 3D display of the mission is going to use a fundamentally different kind of data than a chart or tabular representation. We've encapsulated its reading right over here. The mission data accessor accesses tabular data in the mission using these enums as a reference. These panels then use these accessor layers uh, as they're going into the data. This protects us in the case of the mission data that's collected changes. Panels themselves consist of a controller, a view, and the extractor, which makes things a little bit easy to uh, makes them easy to extend. Now we refer to extraction. What does that mean? In order to meet our performance goals for this application, we need to go through this reams and reams of data, about six to twenty gigabytes per mission. We need to go through this data and render that information down into a form that's easily usable by the application. Our goal was actually to get the data into the format in which it's going to be directly displayed before we even launch the program for uh, user interaction. So at the beginning of our run, we grab the extractors from each panel and execute them in their own thread. Once we performed all this extraction, we need to actually get that data up to the user interface. On uh, how our application controller does that or in the context uh, as it listens for events from the main GUI that says something like, we need to display a panel. Uh, it then tells that specific panel controller to handle populating and update its specific view. So in this case, uh, while we have an application controller that's coordinating our reaction to the GUI, uh, each panel is more or less independent. And as you can see, we have a pretty solid MVC architecture right here that the view up here knows nothing about the controllers of the model, and the model knows nothing about the view. So now Jason's going to, oh, I'm sorry. So how do we add a panel? All we have to do is to create a package and extend those three classes I spoke about before, the abstract, extractor, controller, and view. You can use existing access to the format of the data you're accessing hasn't changed at all. And all you need to do to enable this panel is to add it to a properties file. This way we can change which panels are configured to run for a given mission without recompiling the program. But what if the uh, mission data extract changes? What if the files that the mission has delivered to us, what if their format is fundamentally different than it was before? We just update the reference in the NJOX enums package. Finally, what if we need to store a new data format? All we need to do is swap out the accessors. And there's a high potential here that we don't even need to change the extractors or any panel specific code. Now, Jason's going to tell us about our first group of functionality. Thank you, Matt. So I'm going to go over rules, errors, and filters. One of the big goals of our pr program was to allow UTAS to determine if the violations they were seeing were caused by the pod itself or by the 
a pilot doing some sort of error, maybe flying too fast or one of the temperature sensors going off. So we have this idea of rules and errors. Errors will be anything that the pod would report as an error within its data. So that would be something we could find by going through the data itself. While rules would be violations of the data. So we have to actually know through sets of bounds usually what these violations would be. Um, we also needed to have a way to display this so that the user on, on the runway or the, the field service representative who has the program up can understand what they're seeing. There was some architectural challenges with these. Um, rules versus other data was graphical versus tab tabular data. Um, we had to deal with series for most of the data while rules had error messages, strings, and other sorts of data we had to account for. So we had to architect a slightly different way to extract this data and to use it. Um, the rules panel also had to communicate with the other panels that we have. So we had to take that into account because all the errors would come from, say, our temperature panel or our altitude panel. Um, <clears throat> currently, we are able to view rules, rule violations and error violations. Rule violations are set programmatically, though we have the capability to set them through the properties file. It just isn't implemented yet. Uh, we also have the capability to implement the filtering. So we are going to show you a quick demo here of the rules panel, as well as some other panels. So this is the timeline here in the main GUI. Josh will talk about that in a few moments. Um, we can talk about the uh, file menu here. You can export mission data, which will take it out into a TXT format. You can close the mission, or you can open another set of data to extract and run the mission. Here's the panels. Um, menu, we can go on the rules panel here. It will show you all the rule violations as well as pod error violations we've had for this mission. You can see up top we have a bunch of C, C, uh, S traces. Those are pod violations, while the other ones you can tell they have some of the temperature violations here and some other violations there from other panels. Um, we also have the configurations panel here which shows mission data as well as some of the pod data that will be important to the user. Um, and we have the error panel itself, which will just show you pod errors specifically. You can notice um, the panels can be closed through the menu or through the exit button. You can uh, move panels and resize them as well. Um, we store the dimensions, so whenever you move it and shut it off and open it up, it will be in the same spot. This will be very useful for some of our graphical data, as you will see in a few moments. In the future, we'd like to change how we um, make, display a lot of these rules and errors. We weren't exactly sure what UTIS would want to see and what they wouldn't, so we allowed that functionality to be easily changed so that when they get the program, they can really display what they want to see exactly. We'd also like it, if you, or like for the tables to be um, sized a little differently um, and make it a lot easier and a lot more usable for some of this functionality if we could display different table sizes. And now I'm going to hand it off to Josh, who's going to talk about timelines and graphs. So timelines, graphs, and annotations. The timeline really, we want to be able to play back the mission over a certain amount of time and get values as the mission progresses so that somebody on the field after the flight has taken place can actually kind of feel like they're involved in where the flight's going and what's actually happening at a particular point in time. So we want to be able to play back our mission. And that really gave us uh, the ability to, or the requirement to actually have data points during our playback that would actually have values that we could see and they get updated over time. Originally, this would have just been on the UI itself as a, a, like a, a label, and you'd update it with a number um, and make a new string. But then we also had this idea of a graphical display of all of the data. And that was literally a graph of all the data in one big chunk, one, one image. And that provides you with all the data values already, all the way over time. And so we came up with this, a better, probably easier to associate um, idea where the actual value of that particular graph is denoted on the graph itself as a vertical bar. And as you play along the mission, the vertical bar actually updates itself across the graph and grabs the correct value for that point in time. We also have to display the locations of errors and warnings. When there is an error, as we said before, you want to, we have a way of displaying in the program already, but we have no way to easily associate it with a particular, say, temperature change. So in this way, 
if you can display that warning or error on the graph itself, you can associate the two different data sets together to allow for an easier time uh, interacting with the data. So we had to make a, a slightly special architectural consideration for the timeline itself. The timeline is adjusting and updating times for the entire program. And for all the panels that actually deal with that time, they need to be able to get that new time every single time. And so we had to have that timeline panel actually have a, a timeline widget that is listened to by the context. And the context will then deliver that new time to the correct panels that are displayed and keep it separated out. So currently, we have the ability to display multiple traces on a single graph. And this is customizable. You can add the traces that you want to be on a particular graph, uh, as fine detail as you want. If you only want three traces and you want them to always be shown, you can do that as well. Um, we have data over time, like I explained. That would be the annotation going along the graph as you played along. We'll see that during the quick demo. You can adjust the, speed, the, the variation in the speed of the actual playback, such that if you don't want to see you know, a second by second playback, you can jump as a, a much faster demonstration going back and forth where you kind of you jump values um, to get to a point that you actually enjoy or would like to see. And then we have annotations of errors, which are vertical bars of the annotations, where you can show the ones that are relevant. You can show groupings of, say, just the violations that are based on an aircraft speed rather than all of them at once. So <laughs> I'm play this demo real quick. And what we're going to start off, we're just going to start off opening the altitude panel. And as you can see, we have a, a very quick trace. And this value is getting updated over time. And it just, it'll follow along the graph. The actual annotation will go along. And then at the same time, to demonstrate, both of these are getting updated with the same time value at the same time in sync. Then we can just pause it real quick and we'll close that one. And so then by unselecting that trace, it actually disappears and it then gets re added graph, and then we add a second one. The second one, you can't quite see it, so you, there's the ability to actually adjust the size of the graph and allow you to actually see it. Now, you notice that the annotations are kind of hard to see, and you, as you go back, they kind of go off the screen. So to be able to actually see these easier, you can then manipulate the graph manually and actually kind of see where it is, and even then, they're still hard to see, you can zoom right in. So you can actually focus on the actual part of the data that you really want to analyze and more easily come to an understanding of what's going on. So at the same time, to demonstrate, we can also manually move this around. We don't have to rely on that, that play button, that, that forward speed or back speed. You can drag it to where you want. You can click to move it forward one tick at a time, or one location at a time, okay. um, and really get some good changes there. So in the future, what you didn't see on the timeline were the actual annotations on the timeline itself. So the, the timeline itself could have had the annotations from the rules, and then that would allow a different feature, which is the ability to tick navigate, which is to say, when you have ticks shown or viewable, you can then push a button and jump to the next available tick. So you actually are jumping across the timeline based on where the errors occurred, rather than based on the time that you decided to choose. Then we have a follow-along graph. In my demo, you saw the annotations actually scrolling left after we zoomed in. This is you know, easy to see, but as you progress further, it will actually disappear off the edge of the graph. Rather than that, it would be probably a better, more intuitive feel to it if you could actually just follow the actual annotation along, along where the annotation is generally right in the middle of the screen, and the rest of the graph moves around it to accommodate it. And we have annotation display locations. As you can see, the annotations did overlap. There, it would be very nice if you could actually separate that out and get them all looking nice on the UI rather than having some of those default positions overlap each other on the graph. And then we definitely want to, in the future, add more panels. Um, these are just a couple demonstration panels of a couple graphs, and it's just the temperature in you know, some of the, uh, the altitude here. There's many, many more sensors. Very easy to add just following the structure that we've added. Now I'll hand it over to Harry to describe the Worldwind flight path and bounds. All right. So uh, Worldwind and the flight path and bounds are included in there. Um, Worldwind is an open source project that's put out by NASA, suggested to us by our sponsor, 
that would give a really easy way to have the graphical representation of the flight path itself. So right now, the flight path is represented in basically waypoints and uh, textually. So being able to display it visually gives the person operating the program a little bit easier way to see where the, the plane actually went. Uh, with that, it also display the flight bounds, which are preset uh, waypoints and basically flight boxes of you need to put the plane through this area. And so with that, you can actually see them right on the uh, display and see if the plane went outside those tolerances. Another key factor would be a way to manipulate the display. So if you can just see it, but you can't really move around in it, it's not too useful. So being able to move around, pan, tilt, and zoom, and that sort of thing were really key features we also want to add in there. And finally, reporting speed and location errors. So being able to see it's great, but knowing exactly what happens is even better. So we have, with the bounding boxes and annotations themselves, ways to see both of those errors. Now with this, there was a little bit of a, a technology thing that we had to work through. WorldWind is written in Java using Joggle, which is the Java OpenGL library. So that is built into Swing. Our application, the GUI, was built in SWT. So to merge those two together, we had to go through AWT through a bridge to get all the way down there. And luckily, we did a prototype in winter that that was the time where we actually figured out how to do all of this. So when we implemented it into the program, it went a lot more smoothly. So some of the things, like I said, that we have in there are using colors to indicate where the speed and location errors exist in the bounds. But if you can't see the colors or you want another way to do it, we also have annotations. So there's little text boxes that show up right on the flight path that show you what the errors are explicitly. And also, like I said, the display manipulation. So you can pan, zoom, and tilt like you need to. All right. And so here we're going to open up the WorldWind panel. There. How's it going? Yep. All right. So when the panel actually gets loaded, it's going to take a little bit before the flight path shows up. All the data is already in WorldWind. Right now, WorldWind itself is actually trying to populate all the data and display it the way that it's supposed to. So here we can see that this is the actual very specific point where it starts out. And as you zoom out, you can start to see the whole flight path. Now, these green and red bars are the flight bounds. And as you rotate around, you can actually see how they're the 3D boxes that the plane needs to fly through. And it's a little hard with the resolution here, but all of these include times and whatever the error was. So some of those say that there was a speed error, and it'll tell you what the value was and what it should have been, or if there's a location error, something along those lines. And then you can also move right through where the flight path is to get a better look. So if it's hard to see one of these annotations, you can zoom right into it and see what there is. And then if you want to get a very broad picture, you can also pull back out and see exactly where it went. Right. And so for the future, one thing that we don't display on the world when that would be great is the position of it over time. So all the time data is already in there, and world when receives all of the time updates, but we don't have a way right now to display where the plane actually was with the time that's on the timeline. So being able to have, even if it's a little icon of the plane itself on there, so you can see where it is as you scroll through time, that'd be really helpful. Another option there is fly behind. So you basically attach a camera right to the back of the plane, and as you play through time, you get to see exactly what the plane was doing as if you were in the plane. And finally, adding the visualization of scanned imagery. So the pod is collecting images, or we hope it is. And so being able to project those images right onto the map, or even have them show up in a separate panel so you can see what was actually recovered, would also be really vital. So I'm sure I've given you some insight into the solution that we developed. But how did we get there? Uh, Methodology-wise, we chose incremental waterfall because so much of our eventual submission was going to consist of a frame. Uh, we felt that a cursory sprint zero, like you would use in Scrum, a lot of our team, a lot of our other teams use Scrum. We felt that a cursory sprint zero just wouldn't be good enough uh, for what we needed to build. We needed more time up front to work on requirements and architecture, and that ended up serving us rather well. But one decision we faced was whether to have three or four increments coming into the second quarter. We knew that we had time for four, but we weren't sure if we were going to able to get a decent amount of coding work done in that fourth increment, given this presentation and the technical report that we had to complete. So ultimately, we cut things short at three increments and held only the bug fixes in that fourth. We had a shifting test phase. Uh, coming into the second uh, quarter, at the end of the first increment, uh, we felt like we'd incurred too much technical debt to continue developing new features. So we called a, free, a feature freeze 
Uh, and we spent five days only working on tests and bug fixes. Uh, this ended up serving us so well that we didn't feel the need to uh, have a special test phase at the end of the rest of our increments. We were able to test uh, and do these bug, bug fixes and, uh, organically as part of that increment. Uh, scheduling worker increment, uh, Jira was a big help here. Jira is a project management tool that we started using come the second quarter. Uh, and this did a great job of bringing the sponsor into our process. Uh, that's such a great job, in fact, that for our first two increments, we actually hit exactly our schedule and future goals. Now, the second quarter was somewhat of a hustle for us. Uh, after our incremental presentation at the end of the first quarter, we realized that while we had solid requirements and architectural uh, set up, our code base was almost non-existent. Uh, and so we shuffled things around. We started using this project management tool, Jira. We reprioritized all of our requirements while adding them into this tool. And we started explicitly assigning tasks to our team members instead of just throwing them up into the air. Uh, this allowed us to sort of get our hustle on to the point that we were 90% code complete probably by the end of week six. So this is a really huge turnaround for us. Uh, as mentioned before, there were some technology challenges for us. Uh, thankfully, none that we didn't overcome. Uh, Tuttling through SWT to this uh, Java OpenGL library to draw 2D, which we used for the graphs, was definitely a hassle, uh, which we probably only got through because of our uh, use of POCs. Deploying our pro uh, project in the four formats which were a part of us, or three formats which were a part of us, Linux and 32 and 64-bit uh, versions of Windows, uh, presented problems for the first few increments, but then we started delivering a uh, newly wrapped up executable for each one, and we mitigated that. Uh, finally, time formats and uh, task scans and events. This just had to do with reading the information out of the mission file. We would encapsulated the action of reading them, uh, but we didn't get the information we actually needed in order to parse these really non-regular events uh, until very late on in the third increment. Uh, since we had encapsulated that bit of our project, we were able to throw together the accessors and get this in before the game. Uh, so we feel really good about the features that we developed for our project, and we'd like to open things up now for questions. We're also going to open up a runnable version in case you want to see something that we didn't show you in the videos. Uh, so you mentioned the ABT and SWT bridge. That's obviously a really difficult challenge. Uh, I don't think anyone here would know that Amazon has that. But I also noticed that you like to use a very widely iterative waterfall system, which spreads those people quite large. Why did you like to choose the process that has such a big time frame between uh, idea and the prototype? Well, first of all, the uh, SWT-AWT bridge actually wasn't that bad. Uh, we had more issues with uh, this uh, lightweight component that was used for Draw2D for the graphs and for the Jogo component of Worldwind, which actually came in sort of underneath the swing. Yes, the bridge worked great. In terms of our increments, uh, they, they were about two and a half weeks long, weeks long each. Uh, we felt that was enough, because again, we were doing not iterative development, where we were iterating over sort of the same core, but incremental, where we were really adding chunks of functionality onto an already completed core. And regardless of whether it worked well or not, what was your primary motivation to choose it? Uh, that great, but what was it the incremental water pool? Yeah, area uh, Like I said before, no, incremental. Incremental. Uh, we chose that because we really wanted that startup period uh, that was really heavily engaged in design and architecting our product. We didn't want this cursory sprint zero. We were actually doing things waterfall style for that first quarter. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, at the interim presentation, one of the requirements was the speed of reopening. Uh, the project after the initial parsing. Yes. I was wondering if you had uh, numbers to share on how well you came to achieve that. We don't have numbers to share. I can tell you it's a lot lower than 15 minutes. Uh, do you have that handy? Can you open that from scratch? I can erase on the background here. You, you'll be able to self tell sort of off the cuff. Uh, speaking to that, we, we built in logic to sort of check over our, our panel data cache uh, and see what data needs to be reacquired from the mission as opposed to just opening up uh, what we've already got. It, it takes probably the longest I've seen is about a minute and a half to load from scratch. And, and it's there. OK, so I know most of the useful um, DB110 data is classified. Did you guys have to work that into your system, or was it designed solely to be operating in a sterile environment? Sterile environment. Um, there's nothing classified in and of itself within our program, right. except maybe some of the enums that we developed matched to the data. Uh, Essentially, the people who are using it are able to see the data. So, can you describe your technical approach for a, handling errors? So, when, I should say in parsing. So, you're expecting certain formats, you don't encounter them. How do you get that? 
and not collapse. We thought a lot about it. Uh, there are a lot of instances in which maybe this one line is off, so we could skip it. And, and it was a difficult uh, it was a difficult balance between sort of error recovery and showing you the data anyway versus accuracy. Uh, we actually realized that accuracy was one of our drivers really far up front. Uh, so not only do we log just the, the living heck out of everything that happens, so if there's even a minor glitch, you're going to see that show up in the console. But uh, in a lot of cases, we try to adopt fail, or fail early, uh, if only because this is being used by the military. And while they could probably override that failure, we don't want to give them incorrect information. All right, let's thank the team. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're Team Ritzy, and uh, the project that we worked on was the RIT ITS Status Dashboard, the name is called Rodriguez. Tom Yerke, Stephen Mussel, Todd Thomas, Sean Bunn. Okay, so really quickly what we're going to get into is in our agenda is we're going to go over the context of our project, and what it is that ITS wanted, and uh, also what uh, goals that are team determined are adequate for this uh, project. Uh, and also then we're going to cover uh, design and also what the current status of our project is. And we're going to go over a little demo and then finish up with uh, some of the challenges that our project had, what the lessons we learned, and then talk about uh, our future goals and work if we had more time or what other development teams would work on and what we're doing to uh, close it out. So what ITS wanted for the status dashboard was they needed a near real-time uh, view of their reports of the campus services here on RIT. And they wanted to be able to facilitate the ITS service desk operations uh, using uh, these more real-time and more updated values that currently are there. And they want to also be able to identify abnormal and outstanding performance issues, whether it be in the ITS team or whether it's in the status of the services themselves. And also, uh, it would be a good eye candy to show to people walking by a service desk to show what their productivity would be and what they're working on by showing these metrics. And what the pre-existing or existing dashboard currently lacks is a historical information to show um, what the status of services were at a prior time in history. And um, also, it uh, lacks extensibility in that uh, it's difficult to add on to track and monitor other services. So for example, um, in the existing system here, we can see that um, all the uh, services are listed. However, um, it only shows um, whether there are issues or not, um, only at a certain point in time in history. And it's updated every five minutes as opposed to a more near real-time basis. So uh, I'm going to take it a little 
way to show who's going to talk about the project goals. So to solve the problems that we saw in the current dashboard and uh, what they wanted out of a dashboard, uh, we set up these goals. Um, the first one, and really the main one, is a clear representation of uh, the metric, whatever metric it would be, and the status of that metric in order for them to quickly look and see uh, what they want out of the metric. Um, second, being uh, extensibility. They want to be able to quickly uh, add more views if they, want, if they decide they want a specific student view or something. Uh, with the Web API, they can just contact the Web API without changing anything in the background to ensure that they uh, can extend it that way. Uh, and then we have a plugin system uh, for all the data that we gave from the uh, data sources to external data sources, um, which that can also easily, you just have to create a plugin to contact a new data source. And uh, Jersey RESTful framework to allow for any changes in the back end to easily be um, represented in the time. Um, and then the historical data, as Phil was saying, the current dashboard doesn't really allow for any historical information. So we're allowing them, we save, uh, depending on the metric, we save uh, information for about a week right now and display it to them. Um, depending on what, if it's a statistical metric, then we actually show graphs of the data. And if it's a, just a regular status metric, then we'll actually just show uh, when uh, statuses have changed. Uh, and that's usually only over about a week. So, and then obviously within our project, we wanted to maximize how many plugins we could actually create for them. Um, so this is a list of all the plugins and data, uh, data sources that they would like to have had in the system. Um, but that was, we weren't ever gonna have all of these. Um, so we kind of focused from the highest priority down. Um, and that being the current dashboard metrics was all the metrics that were already displayed uh, on the dashboard, the current dashboard. Um, the email metrics to help uh, facilitate if anyone has any problems with email, they can quickly look at these to see uh, how they are. These are actually private, so uh, you would have to log, log in, um, which is <coughs> in the future. Uh, the network wiring system, so you could quickly look to see if the wireless system's down or whatnot. And the PCR system, uh, ticketing system, and the photo system, which were all pretty low priority ones. Um, and then we wanted to, like I was saying with the other part, is we had these different views that we wanted to make sure they had too. Uh, public facing web dashboard, which is just uh, our main view that shows uh, the public's uh, metrics that we wanted to display. And uh, a service desk dashboard, which would be a 40 inch display at the actual service desk, and admin view to uh, switch up what metrics are being displayed. And lastly, uh, authentication to view private metrics uh, was initially a goal of ours. So let's talk a little bit about our architecture. If you picture yourself as a user who wants to pull up this dashboard and see what all the current statuses are, maybe the historical statuses. Uh, for a second, there are two questions we really want to answer with this diagram. One is, how does data get into the system? The other is, how does that data get to you? So if you start off uh, in, at our external data sources block right there, we have right now uh, two different um, data sources that we're pulling from, for, one for our email metrics and one for all the existing dashboard stuff. Um, right now these are static XML files, I'm sorry, XML files that are just served up by a server, updated about every two to five minutes, um, but our plugins in the data aggregation system are template based. So whatever sort of data source you want, be it a database, flat file, doesn't matter, uh, we can handle it. So we have a data aggregation system which is running all our different data plugins, uh, which they fetch data, they process data, and they push it to the database. Each one of those runs on a separate polling interval, whatever uh, ITS wants to configure. Currently, I believe they are set to two minutes, uh, but configurable. Um, so those are constantly running as a service and those push to our local database. 
So now we're back up here in front of your computer. We've got the dashboard open. And you've got the web the, the <coughs> dashboard. So you have a bunch of different metrics. Uh, each of those metrics is polling um, our web system based on the update rate that we have for our plugins here. Um, fully dynamic. And what that's going to do is it's going to contact through the web API, uh, go through our caching system. If the cache is actually invalid, we'll make it all the way down to our entry points in the database, pull that data, do any processing that may need to be, take place for statistical information, for example, and then come all the way back up to the view that you see. Here are the technologies that uh, made that possible for us. Uh, our database right now is Oracle. We were using MySQL, we switched that about halfway through the project. Uh, the web port is all Java, we use Jersey uh, for a nice restful private API. And our data aggregation system is also running all Java, uh, so our plugins are Java. Um, we're using Tomcat on top of that. Uh, that's what's providing our private interface. On top of that, we have Apache, which is our web server. Uh, we use PHP and CodeIgniter. CodeIgniter is what our public web API is built in. Uh, so that's what all the front ends are going to contact. And then we have various front controllers written in a mix of uh, you know, PHP, CodeIgniter, traditional web technologies, including HTML5. So the current status of the project is that the team has completed three iterations of implementation and um, has begun the deployment process. Um, the completed features um, of the first iteration focused on um, creating a good uh, extensible core framework and the clear representation of metrics and their statuses on the view. The second iteration was um, building upon this extensible framework and creating additional plugins and creating an additional view to uh, prove that our system is extensible and it is relatively easy to create an additional plugin and additional views. And the third iteration was focusing on optimization. Um, the team implemented caching and uh, implemented connection pooling to minimize the amount of connections and queries um, made to the actual database. And, um, on the front end in the third iteration, we focused on polishing the view and um, just the look and feel of the system. And um, we, as I mentioned before, we represent our historical data based on if it's numerical or status based. If it's numerical based, then we show the information on a graph. And if it's status based, then we compress the view so that we only show when in the history the status changes. Um, and I, as I mentioned, we completed all three iterations and have begun the deployment phase. And we've currently deployed the system onto an ITS uh, staging environment. Um, the goals pushed out of scope were um, that metrics can be marked as public or private. Um, and then on the front end view, since we don't have since we haven't implemented uh, authentication with Shibboleth, we just automatically assume that private metrics are can't be displayed at all to anybody. And um, we also did not get to an admin view, which can control um, what's being displayed on the view and on the public facing view. And um, I guess configuring where each um, metric is being displayed, but. To an alternative we created to compensate for this was that we power the view through a configuration file, which um, our sponsors can modify to tweak the view to how they desire. Um, we also didn't get to all of the external services, but in the, these were in the vision of the project, but or in the vision of the system, but for the specific scope of the senior project. Um, they were never really considered, and we were more focusing on the extensibility and getting a good foundation for um, future teams to build upon. All right, so now we're going to give a, a quick demo, starting with the uh, public dashboard. This is the one that's tailored mostly towards the uh, viewing by the staff, such as the service desk staff, campus IT staff, but members, other members of RIT can view this as well if they'd like an update on the system. Uh, so as you can see here, we've grouped the uh, metrics uh, sort of uh, by type. We've got the core services uh, that are mostly from the old system there. We've got the new email metrics down below. Uh, and for each of these groups, you can see 
uh, at a glance what the status of the system is. You get the name, you get uh, whatever data that email or that plugin provides uh, for the current status. You get the time that the data was collected, so whenever the um, system reached out and grabbed new data. If the source of that data provides a time for when the data was valid, it uses that. Otherwise, it just uses the system time when it was grabbed so that we accurately reflect uh, when that data had occurred. Um, we show when the front end was last updated so that you know that the um, front end is continuing to update fine. And we actually use a sort of dynamic system for updating the front end where it'll only check for new update if it's expecting a new update for that metric. And this is configured by using the refresh rate for each metric. Um, the view is completely uh, configurable separately from the data system, as we mentioned earlier. Um, so you can decide which metrics show up where. Uh, like, for example, we have uh, the apps and people metrics showing up as submetrics of the www system. Uh, so that you know they fit within that context. Um, we can also do things like mix and match from different sources, so that the e like the email group, for example, has some metrics that are from the original plugin that give us a more overall uh, sense of the system, but also the uh, metrics from the uh, new plugin that we implemented for this. Um, we also like to show off the historical views uh, quickly. So if we open up the portal. Uh, view, we can see that there were a couple very brief outages, each lasting only about two minutes. Um, and so you can see that, you know, just whenever the system changed, there's a different entry in this row for that. Um, we also show uh, the statistics. So if you open up one of the email uh, statistics, you will get a uh, graph that shows up. And we'll mention right uh, up front that uh, these email metrics would normally be private, so we've modified this data for the purposes of this demo since we don't want the data getting out. Um, but you can see here that you can uh, see the uh, data over time just for the amount of queued messages of the system, for example. Uh, so one of the use cases for uh, this dashboard is let's say that a customer wants to report that uh, their email is coming in slowly or something. So they call the service desk, and the service desk employee looks at the uh, dashboard real quick. And they can see that right now, everything is running perfectly fine. So they can open up the uh, historical view for one of these and see, oh, it was degraded at some point or earlier today. So they can tell the customer that, well, everything's running fine now. There was a problem earlier, but it's been uh, corrected. Um, and they can uh, re you know, handle that relatively quickly. Um, so. The other view we'd like to show real quick is just the uh, optimized for TV view. This is designed for um, just a widescreen display. Um, this is uh, designed to be displayed on a TV that the service desk has. Uh, so they can choose to show up ones that they'd like to show to people walking by, or they can uh, choose to show ones that they'd like to show to uh, the employees for whatever reasons they like. Um, since this is going to be public, like for example here, we've removed the private email metrics um, from this view. And we've also removed any of the interactive elements since uh, people aren't going to actually be using the television. <coughs> All right, so we learned several things throughout the course of this project. Uh, the various challenges that we encountered. Uh, early on, we decided we wanted to use test driven development. We figured that would really suit our approach and that would help us uh, be one of the requirements we have in this highly tested system. And so we started off using that. It worked out really well for some pieces of the system all throughout the project. Uh, for instance, our data aggregation system itself, uh, some of our web stuff. A lot of that was very easily testable, very easily automated. Uh, so it was very good for testing and driven development. But some of our systems, like our plugins, for instance, those have <coughs> unknown input, unknown output, except that it's based on a couple of rules. And so things like that became very difficult to actually fit into the context of test and development in a way that's feasible and actually useful. So uh, that was a challenge incorporating that into every aspect. We ended up having some that were manually tested or that we would find ways of performing simple uh, consistency checks, for instance, and then more of the system that was actually fully test driven. Um, we had a bunch of push and pull with technical stakeholders along the project. Earlier on, uh, we had a lot more flexibility to do things like compromise on our technology stack. As things moved on, 
and we had less flexibility and some things we actually just ended up having to check with the sponsors and uh, stand for a Uber. We didn't have enough uh, room to maneuver at that point. Uh, gaining access to third party, uh, not third party, but external data resources and uh, environments is something uh, that was also a challenge for us because the gatekeepers of those environments and those data sources tend to be very, very busy people. And so some things we got access to relatively quickly, some things took longer. And so we found that uh, communicating early and often was one good way of mitigating that risk. We had a lot of stakeholders on this project. We had uh, sponsors, we had campus IT, we had the web team, we had database administrators, system admins, we had the service desk. And all those people have some say in what we do. Obviously, our sponsors have the final say in everything. But a lot of those people have preferences or requirements. And so putting all those together into a cohesive, coherent project definition, uh, product definition, was a bit of a challenge that we learned a lot from as well. And we didn't have a good number of unforeseeable life risks on the of the sort that you, know, you get in here, day one of senior prize, you know, like, you know, don't put these sorts of things on the risk document because it never happened. For instance, uh, in our team combined, we had a car accident, we had an apartment catch fire, we had jury duty, we had some sicknesses and several other things like that. And so it, it was a challenge to mitigate all those. So we ended up having to change scope, change the effort distribution, things like that. Uh, so some of the uh, future goals and work that uh, we would like to work on if, if we had more time or that um, other developers would be working on in the future would first of all be authentication so that uh, um, ITS staff members would be able to log in and access private uh, metric data such as emails and the data that we've shown in our demo that was redacted. Um, and also um, students would be able to log in if they would prefer, um, but that they wouldn't be shown that private uh, metric data. Um, also another thing uh, that could have been done was the administration view, which uh, would allow an admin, um, such as one of our sponsors ahead of the uh, service desk, to be able to control which metrics or statuses they want displayed on the either the dashboard or the staff view. And also another thing would be a widget-based view of the service desk dashboard. And basically what this would be would just be a, a customizable view of where they wanted their metrics moved around, how they wanted to lay them out, and also how, how they wanted to display their statistics, maybe instead of historical rows, showing it in graphs or in other things. And uh, also getting down to uh, Thing, additional data sources and views that we didn't get uh, uh, time to do, such as the network monitoring system or the phone system. And finally, uh, push notifications were mentioned in that uh, alerts would be sent to ITS members, either through Facebook or Twitter, to be able to alert them what the status of ITS services are. And uh, as far as closing out the project, what we're doing right now is that we're completing uh, our documentation. Um, we're finalizing requirements, and project plan, and design documents. And we're also going to be creating um, our deployment. We're in the middle of creating our deployment documentation and a test plan document for our sponsors and for the SE department. And also, we're going to be meeting with ITS. Um, in order to transfer our knowledge of the project, in order to bring them on board and get them up to snuff with the uh, project. And then we're going to be um, packaging our project artifacts for the department and um, packaging up the source code and deployment and steps for the uh, sponsors and the web team. And uh, then finally, we're going to have a uh, post mortem reflection meeting with our sponsors and our coach. Any questions? Yeah, what was the rationale for your database question? Uh, that was sponsor mandated. So originally, MySQL was uh, was the definition of our database was going to use. After that, uh, about the time, a little before we uh, made our text text, which I believe actually it was a little bit after, uh, it was just decided that Oracle would be the database to choose. Mm -hmm. I know there's two uh, web app servers in that stack, both. Tomcat and uh, PHP slash Apache. 
I was wondering the rationale for both of those. Originally, uh, so when we chose our text decks, we presented our spots with three options. Uh, the first was actually just an all straight PHP stack. Uh, so Web API was in PHP, and then all the other web stuff was in PHP as well, you know, apart from data aggregation system, which is separate. Uh, we also presented them this mixed view, uh, which mm -hmm. is like our third option, and uh, one that was a little more complex. And so we started off pursuing the first, actually, the simple one, all PHP. And uh, as the web team got involved, uh, we have certain ways we do things, and this kind of matches what we use for some other projects. And so that's why when we decided off the third tech stack uh, to switch, that's so we have both. Uh, so now we web APIs and PHP, and then Tomcat. Did Did you use you or your sponsors look at any commercial software that might do similar things to get some ideas? Uh, yes, one of our sponsors looked at uh, Apple's timeline of uh, what their status services was, and uh, we received that email from one of them as far as uh, what we wanted to do. And I believe also one of our own team members uh, may have uh, researched, um, and I think it was Pop, was it Google's? Um, uh, Data service that, um, that they were running. I can't remember for sure, but uh, we did uh, at least receive an email from one of our sponsors that um, at, that this is something that Apple was doing and something close like it um, would be uh, preferable. Also, there were several other monitoring systems that are already in place you know, for networking and for email and various other services that all of you can just sort of monitoring, just not at the meta level that we're doing. And so we did get some answers. I was at the dividing your deployment process and what you need to provide for documentation and architecture. Do you have to come up with that on your own or is it a blind or? So, it's, so is the question of what, whether the sponsors or the team itself um, decided what the uh, process methodology was? Well, that and how, you know, if there are any guidelines you have to follow in terms of your deployment, your return over to that. So as far as our process, um, that was something that the team had uh, decided to, uh, to pick, and we updated our sponsors of what the process methodology was going to be. As far as our uh, deployment, um, what we discussed with them as, as part of our handoff right now is um, um, what information and what data and what uh, source code or any sort of artifacts that they'll need to run on their development staging environment, which is basically um, our uh, handshake, so to speak, and basically where we're starting to um, just uh, start to hand them and tell them how to run uh, the application on their development staging environment so that, and that they can then move it from development to testing and then finally to production. Could you give an idea of the this range of different types of data, you know, what you had to design, adapt to whatever was thrown at you. What types of stuff was being thrown at you in terms of you know, how wide a range of different things was it? In terms of what we knew about, uh, initially we had no clue what sort of data we were dealing with. Uh, maybe halfway through the first quarter, we started to understand initially what we were dealing with our XML files, uh, but we still maintained the flexibility. So right now all we do are XML files in terms of data sources, um, but you know it can adapt to whatever that's it's a top of that. Um, in terms of data uh, contained in those XML files, we kind of mirror our database to the sort of uh, data types that are that are already defined and standardized within ITS so far, and that was an accessibility stuff we did kind of just in case. Um, you know, so we have a numerical database with various different types of string data like uh, degradation and uh, other statuses. But uh, one of the optimization steps we were thinking of for later on is it turns out none of that data is actually processed differently, uh, except for perhaps numeric versus string types. And so we were thinking about maybe simplifying things at some point, but it's something that'll go in our documentation as a suggested new factor. All right, let's thank the team.
So at last, we're reaching the end of our senior project presentation. <laughs> we're, we're reaching the end of the quarter. So we're going to be presenting to you our product, much as everybody else has. We are the projectionists. I'm Mark Schoenfeld. Dan Mendoza. Katsula. I'm Mark Martin. And we work on Atlas. So to run you guys through a quick agenda here, we're going to be giving you an overview of the product and basically its concept why this product exists and like the goals that we were trying to accomplish by making it what we wanted to do to make our sponsors life easier. And then the system we delivered and how that actually accomplishes the goals that we are going to outline. Then we're going to show you guys a demo so you can see the delivered system for yourself. It's always easier to understand what's going on when you can see it rather than just having us talk to you about it. After that, we'll talk about the architecture, which if you have seen our poster or our other presentation has not changed. So just be a nice review for you guys. Then we'll be talking about the challenges we faced in creating this project and our reflection both on the project as a whole and spring quarter. And after that, we will be talking about the future of Atlas because after we are gone, Atlas is going to continue living on in the School of Film and Animation. Okay, so the first thing you might be asking yourself is what is Atlas? Atlas stands for the Automated Transmission of Light, Audio, and Scenes, and it's a screen management system designed for RIT School of Film and Animation. Um, the main reason why we're building Atlas is because the old process was very clunky, very error prone. As our sponsor has said, there was never an entire presentation that went off without a hitch. So we're trying to rectify that for them. So a screen management system is basically a way of controlling a theater system for a single room, um, in particular this room. Um, while our sponsor will be actually doing all of his um, end of screen showings in the Carlson Auditorium will be actually showing you how we can control this room here. Um, so it was commissioned by RIT School of Film and Animation, as I said before. And the main idea was that they want to be able to automatically run an entire showing of about 150 to 200 student films at the end of each quarter. As you can imagine, setting that up by hand could be kind of a pain. So what we decided to do is we said that we wanted to make this as sort of pain-free as possible for them. In particular, they should be able to schedule a bunch of hardware events to go off that particular cadence without having to worry about manually controlling that as the actual show is in progress. Also, they should be able to go through this entire playlist of media files without having to drag new ones in unless they actually want to. And finally, they want to be able to automatically create this playlist without having to have a booth operator sit there on a Friday night and for each of those 150 files say, all right, where does this go in the list? So really, we want as little human interaction as possible. Right now, there are about three or four people who sit in a booth um, behind the whole presentation running the show behind the scenes. They're working a bunch of different hardware controls. They're building this playlist, and they're making sure everything runs smoothly. But people make mistakes. So if we take as many people out of the equation as possible, we reduce the chance for those mistakes to happen. So with our system, they're pretty much only required to sit there in the booth, hit the play button, and just do that whenever things are you know, necessary. We've moved the number of operators down from about three or four to one person. Additionally, we want to save the sponsor as much time as possible. Constructing these 150 video playlists by hand is kind of a pain. So if you can do that automatically, everything gets a lot better, people are happier, and everything is wonderful. And most importantly, the show has to look professional. Uh, David's biggest pet peeve is the fact that when something goes wrong in the booth, the people in the audience are pulled out of the video. They're no longer really paying attention to what the student was producing, what their uh, sort of capstone project was. They're focused on, oh, well, this is disappointing. I was really into that, but now the lights are on. So with our delivered system, we were able to meet all of those major goals, um, and then some. Um, in our last release, we figured we had some time for some of the stretch goals we laid out at the beginning of this project. Most notably, the automatic schedule creation. We can now um, query their, uh, an API that automatically creates the schedule with the time and, and figures everything out behind the scenes. Um, we also revamped the user interface from the original, um, the original concept. Um, if you were at the interim presentation, we talked a lot about a timeline type of interface akin to Final Cut Pro. Um, just because of time constraints and just usability in general, we decided to go a much simpler route that you'll be able to see shortly in the demo. So on the left, you'll see their old workflow that they they've been using. Um, they would first have to download all of the films onto a hard drive, onto a computer, 
and rename all of those files um, with a numbered system just so they don't lose anything and they know what order everything's in. They would then um, print out that schedule and have a copy that they just cross out once shows are completed. And then once a film is, um, once a screening is being played, um, the booth operators have to open up the LC, drag it onto their secondary monitor, which is the projector, um, unblank the projector, turn off the lights, etc. for every film. And then once the film is over, undo all those changes and do that for every film. With our, our system, they still have to download all of the media, but the playlist is automatically constructed, and, and all of those steps on the left there are handled with a single button click. And we will now show you that system. So uh, as we switch over uh, computers here, uh, one thing to mention is uh, our sponsors have been, uh, it, one of the requirements was uh, it would be nice to have it run on the macOS platform, uh, considering that our sponsors are using a, uh, a Mac Pro Tower that they uh, simply lift out of the uh, of a production lab that they have under Building 7. Um, so as one of the requirements, you'll see we've chosen to build this application in um, Cocoa, the OS X application framework. Uh, so the first step in the workflow that our uh, sponsors would want to use this for is importing a schedule for a specific day. So um, they will go um, choose that they want to import a schedule and say, um, right here, we have a list of all of the available um, terms that there have been schedules made. So as you can see, we've selected the uh, 2012 winter quarter schedule. And you'll see uh, various days here that the screenings have been set up for. And all of this is being pulled from um, our sponsors have an existing website where they schedule all of the screenings. Um, the other part of this workflow is that, as mentioned previously, they will have to actually download the files. This is a necessary step. And so we just need to know where those files are. So with that done, we can create a schedule. And what pops up here is actually uh, sort of an interesting challenge that we've had to come across and uh, come up with is um, site profiles. It's simply a way of designating which schedule or which auditorium the schedule is meant to be used in. And so we're going to select uh, Galasano here. And so as you can see here, all of the schedule data has been pre-populated. Um, there's a few missing files here because we simply don't have a full hard drive space to download some of these files. Um, but the important part, say, if we uh, click on um, one of the media files here, there's uh, various metadata that's populated from the website, which we were able to put. <coughs> yeah, so at this point, you can see down here is where we have our hardware events. And those will be executed on a time-based cadence based on when they say they're executing. So when this film is started, that four seconds before media starts, that will be the first event that occurs. And then two seconds later, the two seconds before will start and then the media will actually begin. But before we do that, I think we should mess around a little bit and change up some events. So if you wanted to go put in a custom light event for highlighting the presenters 10 seconds after. And then get rid of projector blanking afterwards, because if that happens, there will be nothing on the projector anymore, and that would not be good for us to continue our presentation. At this point, though, I think, yeah, we should move Highlight Presenter up until before the media begins because it will be hard to view the video. So as you can see, when the events are actually moved, it takes on the timing of the event above it. That was one of our ways of um, getting around, basically, the lack of, of drag and drop time functionality that we lost in removing the timeline. So now if we uh, go click to follow the currently playing asset, and then connect to Crestron, which is the hardware control interface that we're actually using. As you may see, our hardware controls on the actual system have now changed, and they're reflecting what's going what the state of the theater right now. And so if we go hit play on this, the movie will be in play. And we have a check to tell you, hey, the media's not open. So that's the highlighting presenter. <laughs> um, as you can see, there's a little timer down there, three seconds. 
in two seconds, the lighting was going to switch to low light. And so normally, this actual media window would be full screen and on the projector. But since we're mirroring the display to be able to show you both the application and the fact that the media is playing, we also have an option for our sponsors that they requested to be able to basically view this up in the booth without actually pushing the media out. And we're taking advantage of that now to show you both of these things happening at once. And so while this is going on, we have a And then you'd also be able to, if you unchecked follow the currently playing asset, you'd also actually be able to edit different assets. The, we have that there as a way of following the playback. Once you have the actual playlist all set up, you might just want to follow it and watch to make sure nothing goes wrong, rather than be clicking around and start confusing yourself. Um, and then I guess we can show the manual controls. So while this is happening, you can go over to the manual controls and change the lights, and maybe you know, type in a new value for the program. Oh. There we go. That, that one's more noticeable. <laughs> and um, so basically, in a few seconds, can you go back to the following? You guys are going to miss it. <laughs> you weren't quick enough. Well, no, we're there. Okay. So the lights are going to go back to where they were before, which I think is actually this state. And then all the speakers are muted now, so there's no more sound coming out. And one more thing that we could do while that was going on would be to actually open up a new schedule and then choose whatever site profile. You could even yet work on one that's for a different theater while that's going on. And then use a file browser to start dragging them in. They also get auto populated with the default events. So regardless of whether you're importing them or bringing them in from the uh, files, it will import those defaults. And those defaults are actually user defined right now per site profile. So this auditorium may have different um, default events than Carlson, for instance, because they will have different lighting presets and also their response times on the hardware might be different. So it's important to keep that in mind when setting up the event commands. And that about wraps it up for our demo. <coughs> so um, now that you've seen our system, uh, we're going to talk about the architecture of it, uh, how exactly we accomplish all this. So um, the first thing we just want to show you is, uh, in case this is all black magic, um, so right now, for our demo, we had a uh, host running Atlas. Um, like I said before, that will be another uh, desktop that our sponsors will be using. Um, all of the communication that we're doing, uh, whether it be to these uh, Crestron devices, which are the hardware controllers uh, for uh, that we're interfacing with, um, those are all connected uh, to the internet, as well as the um, website, which we are pulling the schedule data. Um, one particular interesting thing about this this is notable is um, the protocol that which we are talking to the Crestrons um, is a low-level, um, you know, byte-wise TCP/IP connection um, that we have defined, and our sponsor, our contact in RT Classroom Technologies has uh, built against. And so this is something that if um, the system were to be deployed in other theaters or auditoriums, that another person with different hardware set could actually go and create um, the same experience using that protocol. Um, um, so now we're just going a quick, very brief view into the architecture of our system. Uh, one thing is that we are uh, based on the uh, NS document architecture, which is used in Cocoa. Uh, and that's pretty handy for us because that allows us to save all of the usual um, like file 
uh, file loading and saving, um, other built-in features which users have come to expect, especially on the Mac platform. Um, here you can see in the document model, um, there's the various uh, models we have for uh, media files, for events that are associated with the media files, and the related metadata. Um, we have our view controller hierarchy over here on the left, on the right, excuse me. Uh, and up here we also have the, the global application scope. Uh, one thing that our sponsors noted is we don't we didn't need to design for uh, playback of multiple screens. And so what we've done to make the architecture a little bit more simple is um, localize all of the um, things that are necessary for communing with the hardware, which over there are Atlas networking packages, uh, which is built on top of the C++ library Boost, and the Atlas Media library, which is built on top of VLC, and subsequently its subjective C uh, bindings called VLC Kit. And uh, through that, we're able to accomplish a, um, a single uh, point of the control for the application. That way, it makes it easier for the user to know exactly which schedule uh, that they're editing and make sure that there's not really a whole lot of confusion there. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we faced while building this project. Um, it's been a long six months, and some challenges have, in fact, cropped up. Uh, two of those were sort of internal design challenges that we faced, and two of those were more external um, interfacing with other parties that we had to deal with. Um, the biggest issue that we ran into was simply site profiles. Um, as we mentioned before, this um, system can run in several different theaters around campus. And now each of those different theaters have uh, different lighting presets, which might be enabled in each one. For example, this one, the Galasano Theater has uh, the highlight presenter, which you saw earlier, which blinded us while the Carlson does not have that same feature. So if you, if you wanted to use that in one schedule, but then suddenly you switch over to say, the Carlson, well, that way increase us over there. So we had to figure out a way of actually handling that with the different systems. So what we ended up having to do was we decided that when you build a schedule, it's going to be built for a specific theater in mind. Uh, we don't do any kind of remapping of site profile of um, the lighting presets for different site profiles. And now that was really enabled by the fact that we can automatically generate these schedules pretty much the click of your fingers. Um, if we had to do that by hand, it would be more of a problem. But luckily, we were able to get around this by allowing them to quickly generate these schedules without having to do it by hand. We thought it would be pretty easy to actually turn onto the same kind of issue because they are built fairly closely into the site profiles. Different profiles have different lighting presets. And if you use those lighting presets in your default events, then they're not going to work for different theaters. So while we initially thought that was going to be fairly simple to just say, well, you have one set of default events which can apply to all schedules you make, we really had to accommodate for the different site profiles as well. Now, VLC and the hardware control were a different sort of beast. Um, VLC, even though it's you know, this really widely used open source platform, was actually a real big painted build from scratch. Um, eventually, we got a stable build that actually worked, but we even had to patch that build to account for a bug which we ran into um, when, we were run, when we were using it. So we had to patch a stable build and then build that and incorporate that into our application. And then hardware control was uh, more difficult simply because of the fact that we were interfacing with a third party. Um, our ETC sponsor, Aaron Roberts, was the actual person allowed to touch and work on all the hardware. I mean, it's, it's a $30,000 system. They didn't really want us in there mucking around with the code, and that's understandable. So we had to interface with him um, with sometimes long delays between what we sent a bug, fee, a bug um, report in to what he actually got back to fixing it for us. So mitigating that risk was one of the biggest things we ran into, and that's why we started doing the networking stuff very early into the system. All right, so just going to get up here and talk about reflection. So we, we talked about reflection in our interim presentation and had some controversial opinions on things. But I would say that we learned from our previous mistakes. We partook in regular risk management when we had very little risk management process in the winter. And the, the more controversial one we had was the fact that we didn't work over winter break and said, oh, well, we learned from our mistakes. We're going to work over spring break, to which there were many voices of dissent that said, no, you won't. <laughs> and well, we proved them wrong. We had multiple Google Hangout meetings and actually accomplished a significant amount of work over spring break. And then um, we continued to work well together in a, another crossover from winter quarter. But what happened this time, now that we were getting more into the nitty gritty of it and doing more visual stuff and then doing more of our like actual programming, 
we were able to uh, supplement each other's abilities nicely, which allowed us to deliver a superior product. And one instance of this is Dan was our Objective-C guru. He was the only one who had ever touched Objective-C at all before we did this project. So he was able to go and mentor us and take over for some of the really complex stuff. We would have benefited from a better understanding of the system at the project's initiation. We started off thinking that we knew exactly what we were going to do and then finding out as time went on that that wasn't exactly the case. For instance, even very recently, we added in support for blank assets as placeholders in the playlist for the ability to just like have something to say, oh, there's going to be analog media here. And while that wasn't incredibly difficult, we would have benefited from knowing that in advance and finding that out. So we could have designed better, which moves into our next point. If we had more detailed design, if we knew exactly what we were actually doing, we would have benefited from being able to create a better design. So going into the future of Atlas, um, since we finished off the major goals, this will hopefully be used for years to come by um, SOFA. Um, any hardware maintenance, any problems with that will be taken up by RTETC um, and any of that communication with Atlas. Um, some of the things we didn't get to or um, a future team might be able to do is Atlas Mobile. Um, since we're using Objective-C, um, porting to an iPhone or iPad won't be as difficult. Um, audio track integration, um, we have just image assets in there if they want to display a picture, if they want to integrate with um, some music or anything, they could add that. And one last thing is deploying in other theaters. Um, we built it modular enough that we can hopefully go on to other hardware control solutions in the future. Yep. Any questions? <coughs> Todd? So this is going to be used for this quarter's final presentation. Right? Indeed. Final um, ones. The start of week 11, starting on week 10. Or, no, the start of week 10. The, the end of week 10. The weekend after week 10, the, the start of week 11. Um, the, the final presentations all take place during that for the first half of finals week. So are they going to have you guys on call the entire half of that? <laughs> um, well, they're actually going to be doing a test run uh, tomorrow. Um, pretty much going to sit down. They're going to do like basically a dry run of the entire schedule and see if anything crops up. So fingers crossed we won't have to even contact them during uh but as we can step through our personal post mortem. <laughs> with the VLC integration, you had mentioned that you had to in order to integrate with VLC, it sounded like you couldn't uh, sort of communicate to it standalone or like over uh, API or other things you had to actually like compile into it? There, there is an, ex, uh, an existing um, library that they distribute. Um, you can build it from source. Uh, it is C-based. The issues that we were running into were that um, their, the application actual side of it was uh, a lot more stable than the actual library that they bundled out for other developers. So um, we had some issues. There was uh, various bugs that um, were getting in our way. So does that now mean uh, when future versions or point releases of VLC come out, uh, before they can be used on the machine running with Atlas, do you need to recompile or? They are um, bundled as a as a shared or a shared library in the application. So. Um, any any new releases to the VLC framework, um, which may accommodate for like new files, um, which would probably be the only use case that they would need in a data version. Um, then yes, they would have to recompile. And I think um, I think the question you're asking is, um, does it just use a standalone installation of VLC on the system? Which is no. Um, the VLC kit basically is part of um, the VLC bundle, which is actually built into an application. So if you update VLC, um, your own standalone VLC player, it will have no effect on the application. Okay. Just wondering, how tied are you to the source website that gives you your schedules? And do you support alternate input formats? Um, we can support alternate input formats <coughs> easily. Right now, we receive a JSON schedule list, basically, um, simply because uh, we actually contacted um, the person in charge of that website, um, Brad Kudrin. And about five minutes in, it was like, yo, I wrote a 
JSON API for you. Um, so we sort of we just sort of use that. But other formats were considered, and there are definitely possibilities um, depending on who supports them. Any other questions? Let's thank the team. Few minutes early. Well, okay. Hi, everybody. We are the last team. We are Team EMJ. We worked on the MITRE Gamify facilitation system. As you all know, I'm Todd Williams, Delta Water, uh, E. Jelly, Building Hall. Okay, so let's get into it. Just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to give you a description of our projects. I know just off the name it doesn't really make a lot of sense, and some of you weren't the intro presentation and haven't seen anything, so we're going to go over that first. Uh, then a brief overview of our architecture and the basic implementation we came up with. Uh, then a nice nice live demo for you, followed by a discussion of the deliverable we gave to our sponsors two days ago. And the future plans for our project. Finally, we'll leave you time for some questions, and hopefully we'll try to get out of here a little bit before six. How's that sound? Okay, getting started. The problem description. Our project is named the Miter Gamified Facilitation System. Now, to a lot of you, that probably just seems like a giant pile of buzzwords and doesn't mean anything. But actually, the entire problem and description of the project can come from those four words alone. So if we get started at it, with the very first word, it's Miter. That's our sponsors. And for those of you who don't know, they are a government think tank research company that is based out in Boston. And like any medium to large company, they hold quite a lot of meetings and discussions and things like that. And again, like a large company, if you have a meeting with, say, 20 people, it's probably going to take a bit of time for everybody to get there, get on the same page, get everything going. I mean, look at this. We had this thing whole, all scheduled, and it still took us like five, ten minutes to get everybody in the, same, in the same mode. And if you think about it, for a company, and you're paying everybody, if you've got 20 people wasting 10 minutes, you effectively pay one of them for the day to do nothing. So if you do that, a bunch of meetings, all over a giant company throughout the year, it is a huge problem and it costs a lot of money. So what MITRE tries to do to fix the problem with this is they have <laughs> activities that they try and do either before a meeting or at a meeting. So for example, for a project kickoff meeting, they have something called a cover story, where they'd have everybody on the team try and write the trade article that would come out. Like, say if you were doing a project and when it was done, what would the wired article that showed up be for that project? So the way they did it in the past is you'd have a piece of paper, the person writing the meeting would start by writing down, okay, wired article for project T. And they'd hand it to the person on their left who would write one sentence, hand it to the person on their left who would write one sentence, and that'd go around a couple of times. And then they'd have to discuss that. And that, it takes a while. So that's where our system comes in. It's the facilitation system, and what it does is it takes activities like that or another one which is a type of brainstorming and offloads them to a web app so that everybody can work on them remotely. And so instead of spending 20, 30 minutes at the beginning of a meeting, have everybody just, okay, write it, 
Here you go. All right, there you go. They can offer that, do it in a distributed manner. So somebody, if, hey, you've got 10 minutes of your time, they'll go in and be like, okay, it's my turn. Punch in a sentence, go. So that's the main point of it. It's writers trying to make their meetings more efficient, waste less time, and they're trying to do it via a distributed manner, which, again, yeah, sounds a little commonplace, right? So that's where our unique selling point comes in. It's the gamification. Now, I'm sure all of you can think of at least one video game, be it World of Warcraft, Words with Friends, heck, even Angry Birds, that for some reason has just suckered you in and you just keep playing it and playing it and playing it and playing it because you just want to get to that next level or finish one little bit. And there's actually some very basic psychology to that, and that's what our system is for. Because without that, your boss would just say, hey, before this meeting, go and do this activity. And it would be the same as if your boss would say, okay, before this meeting, read this article. Maybe you do it, maybe you don't. But the point of this system is we include a gamification aspect to it, which is what brings the whole point of our project to bear. Because what Mato came to us and said, hey, we'd love to make the system, and we'd love for you to gamify it so we can test it out with our people and see if this gamification actually works. Because there's, actually, there's very little research in major companies to see if gamification on this scale will actually work effectively, especially with adults. Works great with little kids. But with adults, it takes some serious, you need to prep it. So they came to us and said, can you make what is effectively a functional prototype so that we can see if gamification works, and if it does, we can bring it up to our bosses and say, hey, look, we can build a system like this, and it's saving us you know, 20 minutes per meeting, multiplied by X number of meetings, multiplied by X number of people in each meeting, and look, it will save you millions of dollars a year because everybody will show up, they'll spend five minutes before the meeting, which five minutes, five minutes, and then we won't have to waste half an hour of everybody's time getting everybody on the same page. So that's what our system exists for, is to give them that data, to give them the essentially core of that pitch that they can bring to their bosses and say, hey, look, this is great. Give us the resources, the people, the money to build an in-house system to do this for us. OK? Now, to give us a, give you a brief overview of how we actually managed to accomplish this, I give you our chief architect, Dustin Bottom. Oh. So as you, as you can see here, we tried to keep our tech stack really simple. Uh, we use Java. We also use GWT. We did this so that we could get everything up and running almost instantly. That way, we could get demos out to MITRE within the first few weeks. Um, everything, uh, all from top to bottom, it's all all Java, and we, we use GWT because of that. It allowed us to write, write all the client side code in Java as well, which allows us to test it very easily. It allows us to keep track of everything very well. Um, but no matter what, since all of us are very familiar with Java, and there is only one of us on the team very familiar with JavaScript, this worked out very well because it gave a lot of common ground, top to bottom. All of this just runs in, inside of a, your standard uh, Tomcat instance. This ended up being a, a blessing because while MITRE came to us in the first place and told us that this needed to run on a Windows server, we got a Windows server, deployed it to it, um, this was our standard deployment when we actually went to give them our first release. Despite what they said, they turned around and deployed it to a Linux VM. Mm -hmm. So there were no worries there. That was all fine, Danny. Um, below, underneath all this, it's just running on top of a MySQL database. Again, commonplace. We all know um, how to work with it. We've all worked with it before. It only takes a few minutes to spin up a new instance of a MySQL database. Um, so again, everything was done so that we could get this up and running instantaneously. All right. So now we're going to show you guys a demo. Uh, usually I click on this big red button. Uh, that gets us to this, uh, opens up this link and Sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, this is the first screen you see when you launch the application, and as we mentioned before, this is a, a distributed web app. So as you can see, it's running uh, in Chrome right now. You can just open it with a with link. Uh, this is your you know, regular login screen. You have your username, password. Uh, clicking on register, you can make a new user. And we have uh, some more <coughs> error checking here. I don't know if you can see clearly on that, but uh, here it says the username has already been taken. Um, and then we have some other error trackers, such as uh, email format and uh, password. But for quick demonstration purpose, we're just going to log into a user that we have already created. Sure 
All right, so here we are uh, on our dashboard, and on the uh, top right, we have a menu item uh, for quick navigation, so we can navigate between the dashboard and the account page. Uh, if you go to the account page, uh, here you can change your uh, password and email. I'm going to go back to the dashboard. Uh, so on the left-hand side, this widget right here is our uh, achievement widget. Uh, right now, we don't have anything in it, uh, but in the future, this widget will be used to show uh, game five achievements. <coughs> uh, some top elements here. Uh, here's your uh, avatar that you can upload to the system. Uh, here's your username, <coughs> and below your username, there, there's your uh, local. Uh, so we have the concept of, uh, in terms of gaming, anything that has a bar and has some numbers on it to get people going forever. Uh, <coughs> so we have point and reward system associated with anything you do with our system. Uh, for example, if you're playing with, uh, if you're playing a cover story game, and you write a sentence, and if somebody writes upvotes uh, your sentence, uh, you get a certain amount of point whenever uh, you receive that upvote, and then that point gets counted towards uh, your leveling, uh, and you can set like a set amount of experience for each of the levels. So eventually, your level will increase. Um, and so here, right now, you can't see because we don't have, we don't have the uh, achievements, but in the future, um, clicking on this button will display a list of achievements here. And for example, an achievement could be like writing a sentence and within 10 seconds get upvoted by five different people. Uh, and then clicking on this one, uh, in the future will show a uh, list of statistics uh, with all the games that you've been playing. Uh, so on the right hand side, this widget is used to display all the games that you've been associated with, uh, which will include the games you create by yourself as a facilitator yourself. Uh, and the games that other people have created and invited you to. So uh, we're just going to go by column here. The first column here, uh, this is the image uh, or avatar of the uh, facilitator of this game. Uh, and the second column is the type of the game, which right now we have a uh, cover story and an anonymous brainstorm. Uh, the third column is the name of the game, the name of the meeting, however you want to call it. And the last column is whose turn it currently is. Uh, now, for some games, there isn't a concept of turn, but for games such as uh, Cover Story, there is a concept of, of turn. And as you can see, some games it is my turn, and some games it's not. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so, in the last demo, we've uh, shown you guys uh, how uh, we could create a game, uh, especially Cover Story. And we've improved that by using a, a wizard system. <coughs> so, you can see here, uh, here's how you select the uh, type of the game. Uh, I'm not sure if Looks like it. Yeah, okay. So yeah. So this is a cover story. This is a non Um uh, And here we can so, uh, <coughs> we can choose the name of the game. <coughs> so let's just say <coughs> my conference. <coughs> Sorry. So let's just say uh, my conference demo uh, number one. And so here uh, you can see a date, and this is actually a button. Clicking on this shows up a date picker. And you can just kind of pick a date, so we're just going to go and pick a date now. Um, just for that, we can purpose. And uh, if we go to the next page, uh, on the left hand side, this is a list of uh, participants. And, and you can select participant by clicking on them. And you can simply deselect the participants by uh, clicking on them again. For demonstration purpose, uh, we will just uh, select this account. I can see the equipment. Does that say demo two? Demo. Yes. Oh. demo four. Demo four. Okay, so demo four. Uh, that's me. Okay. Uh, and for demonstration purpose, we'll set the turn lines to one. We we'll get we give it a whole bunch of uh, upload limit, whole bunch of downvote limit, and we'll just click. Finish. Um, and as you can see, our game is created somewhere. Um, this one? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So as you can see, our game is being created. Um, and so for demonstration purposes, uh, we could uh, open a different tab. We'll just log in and demo four. Uh, 
and we, we, uh, we see that we have been uh, invited to the game, so we can just click on it to go into the game. All right, so now we see both users are in the game. Um, hmm? Yeah, they're in the game. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so th this user is a facilitator, uh, and you can see it has the option to delete a sentence. Um, and so I'm just going to write a sentence real quick. Um, well, my turn line's passed, so we have to use the turn line. Yeah, so we set the turn line to one minute. And on the right hand side there, you can see that uh, there's how much seconds left. So I've written a sentence, it is no longer my turn. Uh, if I go here, write a sentence. Sentence two. So now we have two sentences. Um, and as a recap, uh, our cover story is uh, you have a bunch of people sitting, uh, sitting together, and they're contributing to the same article by writing uh, sentences. And then when it is either their turn or not their turn, they can then click on the sentence and upvote, give us some upvote or downvote. So when we give a sentence upvote, we can visually see that the sentence is becoming bigger. Uh, showing which sentences are the most popular. So we can give a uh, sentence some downloads here, and we go over here, uh, and give some more uploads, uh, give some more downloads. Uh, and as a facilitator, I can delete a sentence, so we just get over here, we can delete a sentence. Uh, and then for convenience, we've added a dashboard button here, so we just click on that and the that's our And alternatively, you can use the right uh, so also we have an uh, anonymous brainstorm, uh, and we're just going to go into a game that we've already created. Uh, so as a recap, a anonymous brainstorm is you have a group of people who are uh, who have a topic, and they want to anonymously come up with ideas and post them on the board. So when you post an idea, for example, like this, the uh, And you can see that the idea shows up at the end. Uh, so it will show up like that. <clears throat> and so everybody can see it. And, uh, they won't see who posted the idea and when they just posted. Uh, and then you can like an idea by, by simply clicking on the like, uh, like button. We do not have any visual change when an idea is liked uh, because we don't want you to have any bias towards ideas that are already uh, popular. So. Uh, but at the end of the day, everything is uh, tracked in the back end. So the facilitator, when the game is uh, ended, the facilitator can pull up all the statistics, all the data, uh, like which are the ideas that are voted the most and stuff like that. Um, OK, so we're just going to go back to the dashboard. And that's pretty much all we have uh, for showing for the demo. So we're just going to log out. Close it. Okay. OK, so our final project is livable. As I've said, we actually had our sponsors up here on Tuesday for a nice four-hour code slash knowledge handoff where we actually gave them the majority of this deliverable. As you can see, the three major components of our deliverable were the knowledge required to use the system, the source code, and this little thing down here, which is our entire JIRA project that we're using to track it, which includes both all of the known minor and major bugs, mostly minor at this point, and all of our future plans and stories that we came up with, up with at the beginning, back when the uh, code of uncertainty was roughly the size of Portugal. So there's actually an entire game hiding in there. Which, thankfully, because our sponsors also use Jira, transitioning all of this is a simple download of an XML file and an upload back up there. And they actually specifically requested that we include this in our project deliverable. But the major component of the deliverable, and the main reason we had them fly all the way out here from Boston for a four-hour meeting two days ago, was the knowledge transfer. Because, as you saw, the main part of the system, which is the data tracking and the metrics that they need to show their bosses that it's working, that's there. But while they're testing that out and getting all the data they want, they're also going to be adding a few extra bells and whistles. So what we needed to transfer over to them was all the knowledge they needed for that. Mainly, how to create a new game in the system, step-by-step -step process, the notes for that, and how to do it. We actually 
get had their co-ops that's going to work on it in the room with us and gave them a step-by-step -step through saying, okay, start at this code, you want to create this, then next you're going to create this, then this, and just all the way through it, everything's written down. And the other big part of that knowledge transfer was how to go from a completely blank system to our code installed, compiling, and running, which we actually did that on Tuesday. We had one of their people there, took a Mac, wiped everything, all the dev tools he had on it, and went from downloading Eclipse, downloading the GWT plugin, pulling from our repo, getting everything compiled, getting everything going, as well as, as he was doing that, creating a step-by-step, -step, essentially idiot-proof guide to get somebody up and running, working on our code in five minutes, yeah. So that was one of the main transfers, is now all of the knowledge we have about the system and all of the knowledge that you need to continue working on the system is in MITRE's hands. They have it, and they're good to go. And this final deliverable will actually be with the code and everything packaged up and given to them in a few days. But as I said, the knowledge, which is the one thing you can't package up into a zip file, that is there, and that is transitioned to them, and they have that. Another fun bit about the deliverable, it also includes this presentation. Because we gave it to them yesterday, they actually recorded the whole thing and are going to give it to the new people working on the project. Because it's a very good prep and primer for somebody going into it. And last but not least, Logan, would you like to discuss future plans? I would love to. OK, so now that we've been working on senior project for two quarters, now we put our blood, sweat, and tears into this, what's going to become of this product that we made? Uh, one of the major things that MITRE wanted when we were first collecting our uh, requirements was a third game, as we correctly predicted we would not have time for. Uh, this game is called Empathy Map. This is a real life example of what would happen. Uh, the little fellow in the middle there would represent either a customer or a potential client or a potential employee or something like that. Uh, for this example, we'll say he is a future customer of a product that we're about to make. Uh, all the different sections around him are his senses, what he's seeing when he uses this product, what he's hearing, what he's thinking, how he's feeling, all of these kind of things. Uh, other than that, this is very similar to an amount of brainstorming kind of game. It would most likely be asynchronous. People would be able to go into our system anytime they wanted during the game, obviously, uh, and create an idea, post it into any of these sections. You'd be able to like things, dislike things. Obviously, people would be getting points and things based on that. Uh, and then at the end, you would, again, have the most upvoted ideas be prominent, and you would be able to go into the meeting and see what the customer think, what the customer is thinking, how their perspective of things. You're just trying to get a feel for what the customer actually wants in this game. Uh, other than that, what is coming up, as Todd said, at our uh, handoff meeting the other day, they brought a co-op who will continue development on this. Uh, he's going to be implementing the empathy map. He's going to be adding lots more bells and whistles, some of the gamification parts of it, like the achievements that we were not able to finish. Uh, he's obviously going to be fixing some of the bugs that we may have created, anything like that. Um, uh, other than that, they have been collecting data since the time that we gave them one of our final builds a, uh, about a month ago, and they will continue to gather data and just see if this system actually works, if it's doing what it's supposed to, if it's cutting back on meeting overhead and saving people money. Uh, if it does that, then they will be pitching it to their higher ups, and if they are able to convince them to give them budget to create this system, then what is going to happen is they're going to throw away everything that we have been working on and start from scratch. They are going to be do, throwing everything out and using their own tools, their own technologies, adhering to their own standards, and everything that they didn't limit us to when we were presenting. Uh, are there any questions? Yep. So um, one of the things about Ajax, people want to be able to show off their achievements. I know that Miner has their own building sort of social networking at their um, Boston campus. Was there ever any consideration of integrating Greg with that so they show off their fancy achievements on those apple? Absolutely, yeah. Um, one of the, between the, there were three key points of, of data, um, the MySQL database, Elm, which is their customized version that they use that they call Handshake, um, and then possibly Google Plus. Okay. They just they wanted to integrate with all of them. 
even not tied into that, there is a system in place for essentially looking at your friends, how many points they have, how many achievements they have, and putting yourself next to them and going, ha ha, I've got 10 more points than you. So yeah, no, that's definitely there. Greg? Um, I know this is just very common, I think, but very occasionally, I noticed a very presentation of all the two separate tabs, close to your second yep. thing. Um, actually, when we first started with MITRE, one of the first things I said, like 20 minutes into our very first requirements gathering was, do not worry about verification. If, if and when we create our own system, it will tie into our own LDAP service. And with the, one of the previous senior projects, they had the team spending three quarters of their time just trying to tie into that. So they were very explicit that you do not have to worry about that. All we pretty much have is a password system hash on that end. But yeah, there is no client side off cookie that, that, that keeps the login and prevents you from logging multiple times, which makes testing so much easier, as you can see. Anybody else? Uh, clearly, you've done what they asked you to do. Uh, did, did you ever question the, the concept of human factors, uh, psychology, that this would work? What they're trying to do because this well, seems strange to me, but maybe it's something that's I don't what we're trying understand. To because the logic's there. Ask anyone in here who spent more time on DAO than they should have and didn't eat. The base psychology is there. It was actually proved by um, Skinner about 60 years ago that if you take a reward and delay the payoff of that reward, you can get somebody to essentially forego anything to get that reward. But the point of our system is to see if that psychology can be applied in this way to actually improve it. Does that make any sense? But, but you're asking them to fill in sentences, right? Yes. This is a and people sentence. like them and they get bigger and that yep. is that enough of a reward to get people to that that's what the system is aimed to find out. If we can show that that's enough of a reward, then like those are the basic tenets of the competition. If we can show that those work effectively. And then the mighty people can show it to their bosses. Then that means the system succeeded. Did they? Were they the ones that said uh, make the words bigger, or did, is yes, that your idea? Because the way they wanted it is, if you were at the very end, if you would actually use this in before a meeting, and you pulled that PDF generated at the end, you could see what everybody's like would be really big and really obvious, and the stuff would be shrink down to about that big, and you couldn't see it from ten. So make it much easier to just focus on the parts people want. And, and when will they run this test, and when will you have an answer from them whether it works? They've been running it for about a month, and they haven't told us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do they estimate it'll take a couple of months to know whether it works, or? Um, I don't think they, no, they, they didn't really just going to run it. Well, yeah, the most likely time frame that we can guess is they'll be running it throughout the duration of the co-op who's there adding bells and whistles, so they can have a, a nice polished version plus all the data to back it up when they go to my pitch. Okay. But that's just pure guesswork there. Professor Lena, you had a question? Yeah, so is there a way to turn off the gamification? Because here's 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 what I'm thinking. Is, you, you, describe, you, you describe what they do right now as a piece of paper passing around the room. Yeah. There may be a big leap in productivity just being like a collaborative right. system, <laughs> and the heck with the points, you know. And Did we know with proper scientific methodology and have a control system with no gamification? I'm, I'm just asking there, is the capability if somebody wanted to ask that question. As of right now, no. Gamification has been a part of this system since it was initially conceived, like before they even pitched to the SE department. Gamification has been there, so it is inexorably tied to the system. You could always turn off the UI. You can go into the UI and just hide it. But if you don't want to see it, it's not the entire app. Anything else? Or does everybody just want to go home at 6 o'clock? That's what I thought. All right, thank you.